for Apostle Mike Connell. There he is. He comes to bring the word this morning. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap. Let's lift him up and shout to him today. Come on, one, two, three. Let's shout to him. He's the Lord. He's our God. We honor you, Lord. We welcome your Holy Spirit to come. Give revelation to our hearts of the reality of Jesus. Make his presence manifest. Let miracles flow. Let people's lives be touched. Flow out today in our midst. Holy Spirit, let the heavens be open over us. We want to know Jesus. Lord, we honor you and welcome you. Touch us here today. Touch those watching on the internet. Lord, we welcome you. of God there is here. Come on, turn to someone, give him a high five before you sit down. Make him really welcome. Thank you, musicians. Let's give them a clap. That was great. I really loved it. It was awesome. Great. I want to especially welcome those who are watching on the internet today. I know some of you are watching in different countries and uh, welcome this morning. Whatever God's doing here, He wants to do for you as well. And uh, I know that uh, you're hungry for revelation, hungry for God's Spirit to touch you. And uh, right across the world, we believe that uh, you are a part of what God is doing. He wants to pour His Spirit onto you today. And I'm sure that what God does here, He can do for you right in your room. Amen? Amen. Isn't it great? Why don't we thank the media team, all these young people making us go out all over the world. Isn't that something else, eh? Isn't that something else? Great. I want you to open your Bible with me in Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2. And uh, I want to, I, I've been enjoying it. I love sitting under Dave's preaching now. It's actually quite nice to come home and just sit and enjoy Dave. my son preaching. And it's good stuff. I bring my notebook along and I take notes. See? How many dads do that with their son, do they? But he, he's always got something great from heaven. I, I love it, and, and I, I'm enjoying the maturity of his uh, ministry. It's really wonderful. Just appreciating it very, very much. And uh, getting good feedback on, uh, uh, online and uh, also from people in the church. I want to share with you a message a little bit different to what we've been flowing in. But uh, I want to, we've had a season of prayer and fasting, and I want to speak on the majesty of Jesus. So it's not a message just about how to do life. It's a message about a person and shifting how we see him. When it shifts how you see him, it'll shift how you relate to him. The way you see Jesus will affect how you relate to him. And so we need our mind renewed. We need our mind lifted up and renewed so we begin to see him differently. The Bible says, beholding him, we are changed into that image. So what image do you have of him? How do you see him? And if we will hunger for revelation, God will open our eyes to see what Jesus is like. And what you'll find is there is always more and more to experience and encounter of him. Let's just start off in, Revela in Matthew chapter 2. And uh, it says this, it said, after verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king? 
Now, a lot of people, and when I grew up, the, the concept that was presented of Jesus, especially around the Christmas time, was like a helpless baby in a manger. And that was kind of the kind of concept we had. And, and uh, the rest of it was God was very distant. But uh, what I want you to see is that that is, that is not what God wants us to see. In that verse, the focus is not on the baby. The focus on he is born king. He is born a king. You know, the fact that he came into the world in such an inconspicuous way does not change the fact he was born a king. He was always a king in eternity. He was always a king in heaven. And this king who was in heaven came into the earth. He's still born as a king into the earth, but he's the most unusual king. He is a king who has come on an assignment to rescue his people out of the clutches of sin, out of the clutches of the devil, out of the clutches of poverty and sickness. He is a king who will lay down all his glory and come and serve people and bring them out into a place of freedom. This is our king. When you read that verse, focus not on the baby, focus on the king. So often when we look at people, we see the limitations of where they are. We don't see the greatness that's inside them. That's what God sees. When Jesus was born, he was born as a king. And the Bible says, King Herod was troubled. In other words, he recognized there was a threat to his rule. This little child that was born into the world was about to upheave the kingdoms of the world. And so I want to just talk somewhat today about the majesty. When we look at the word majesty, majesty is a title you use to address royalty. So they call the queen. If you had to meet the queen, you'd uh, have to ask as a number of things. First of all, you would have to ask, what is the protocol for meeting with the queen? It's not you go down, hey, how you doing? It's nothing like that. There is a, a way of entering the presence of royalty. I'll get to that a little bit at the end. But there's also how you speak to royalty. And how do you speak to the queen? Your majesty. See, so the word majesty is always connected to royalty. It's connected to a king, a queen. It's connected to someone who is a ruler. In the, uh, in the, new te in the, in the dictionary, it's the title used to speak to a king. It means royal or stately dignity it means supreme greatness or authority. There are two words used in the Bible uh, pretty well for majesty. The one in the Old Testament means uh, excellency. It means to be, uh, it means grandeur, something grand and mighty. That's the word that's used to describe it. So when it calls a person, it, it describes the word majesty. It's magnificence is the word that's used. Ho! Oh, awesome! With an O. Awesome, that's right. And uh, or in the New Testament, the word is uh, the word megaliotes, mega meaning maximal. It means magnificence or full of power and authority. So when we talk about the majesty of Jesus, we're talking about his absolute magnificence. We're talking about his authority that nothing can, hear, that nothing can resist. We're talking about the greatness of him as a person. It's always connected to who he is. And when we come to worship him, we come to walk with him, we should not be familiar the fact that he would reach down and come near to us to befriend us and save us, we still need to keep respect and reverence for who he is. He is royalty who has left heaven and come to earth that he might include you in a royal family to become part of a family that will share his rulership, the majesty of Jesus. So uh, we want to go through it. I want to share a few scriptures out of it. Firstly, we'll look in Psalm 93 verse 1. And look at several scriptures because, uh, and even when you read the scriptures, you don't need to say a lot about them. They say a lot themselves. And let's have a look in Psalm, and uh, we read in Psalm 93. Psalm 93, this is what it says. It says of Jesus, or it says of God, notice what it tells us. It says, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. And then what else does it say? He is he is clothed with majesty. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. He's girded himself with strength. 
Verse 2, your throne is established from eternity. Well, it says, so it says then, God is clothed with majesty. In other words, if you were to encounter him and to meet him, you would be stunned by the brilliance of what he's like, his appearance. He is clothed. Majesty, magnificence, power, and authority are what he clothes himself with. Now, some of we all got dressed today. We came out, and you kind of wear some kind of clothing. And uh, so uh, you, some people wear cl- casual clothing, wear jeans or whatever. You wear what you feel comfortable with. Or if need be, you dress up. And when you dress up, it looks a bit better than just if it's too casual. And so God clothes himself with majesty. In other words, if we were to encounter him, the brilliance of how he is would overwhelm us. The Bible says that if you were to stand in his presence to see him, it would overwhelm you. You could not live to see his presence. That's why God uh, hid Moses when he showed him and revealed to him what he's like, showed his majesty, showed his glory. And Psalm 104, verse 1. Psalm 104 and verse 1. Look what it says here. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Why? O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. You cover yourself with light like a garment. So it tells us then that God clothes himself with brilliant, radiant light. So if we were to encounter him, we would encounter the brilliance of his light. His majesty would come and touch us deeply. And it says the only response to that, and you notice David from his spirit is saying, oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. He's clothed in majesty. In other words, the majesty of God should invoke something in you. If you have little revelation, you'll have little response when you come to worship him and come into his presence. We are to respond, bless the Lord, speak about him, declare his mighty works, admire him and honor him. That's the only response when you come into, into his majesty. Eh? So he is a king. He, the Bible calls him the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So a king is someone who rules over a territory. They have a, a realm of their reign. Their reign is called their kingdom and the king rules over the kingdom. So the queen has a realm she rules over, but is very limited. This one that we serve, his kingdom is unlimited. It is an eternal kingdom. His kingdom, he rules over all of creation. He created it. He redeemed it. He rules over all of creation. He is the king of kings. He's the Lord of all lords. In whatever rulers there are, no matter how magnificent they may seem to be, he is above all of those. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. How magnificent is our God. So we need to catch the awesomeness of our God. And so, of course, many people say, well, you know, if, if God is king or if Jesus is king or if Jesus, if God is God, how come we've got all the problems here? How come there's so many problems in the world? If God is God, why doesn't he step in and do something? Well, he has stepped in to do something. You have to understand, it tells us in Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you come to encounter, to visit, to build relationship with him. For you made man a little lower than the angels and you made him or gave him glory and honor and made him to have dominion over all the works of your hands. So in other words, God made the earth for man. God created the earth for us to live in. He created us to be creative in it. He created it for us to have dominion in it. He created it for us to express His goodness and His character and what He is like in the earth, to express His love. It is man's rebellion against God, his resistance to his father that caused him to fall from that sonship, sin into the world, and then another kingdom became established. The kingdom of darkness began to weave its way into every fabric of society. Poverty, wars, strife, oppression, depression, suicides, addictions. All of these things are another kingdom at work. A shameful kingdom. A kingdom of darkness. And our king will never violate the order he put in place. So his way of resolving this dilemma 
was to leave heaven to send his own son, Jesus Christ, who would come into the earth as a child, born king, to come and take back the dominion, to come overcome the devil, to restore man back to the glorious place of sonship in a royal family. What an amazing king. I don't know any king that gets off his throne and comes and does the dirty work. It just doesn't happen. This is part of the magnificence of our king. He is full of humility. His nature is that of a servant. So he comes to serve. So he doesn't enter into the world with fanfare and trumpets. Not the first round. The first round he comes quietly, quietly as a servant to demonstrate the character and magnificence of his kingdom. It is permeated with a servant nature. So he came to be a servant. And so as we look through the Bible, we will find there are a number of examples where the majesty of God is put on display. And what I want to do is I want to go through these and just read them. I won't say a lot about each one, but I want you to see that progressively through the Bible, God puts his majesty on display. Oh, I just... I, you know, it would, it's just so good if you could just imagine this. You know, to just go into the Scripture and look at the story and try and put yourself there. Often what happens is because our heart is dull, because there's hardness spiritually, we are not uh, impressed. We read the Scriptures. We don't look in to see what it's saying. But let's just have a look at a few of them. We'll go back and I'll show you several instances where the majesty of Jesus is put on display. It is just stunning. So in the Old Testament, God gives some displays or revelations of His majesty. In the New Testament, Jesus reveals His majesty in a way that's unmistakable. I'll show it to you in, in several scriptures. Let's have a look at, first of all, Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19. Exodus 19. And uh, <clears throat> this is concerning the people of God. And this is the encounter at Mount Sinai. Encounter at Mount Sinai. And so we read down there. Let's see if I can find it now. Around about... Ah. <laughs> you read it in, in, in this chapter here. It tells us that the Lord came down. Exodus 19, verse 16. Now it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of a trumpet very loud. In fact, so loud, millions of people trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet what? To meet with God. And Mount Sinai was completely covered or completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and the Lord answered him. Now you just got to read that over and over a few times. You got to meditate on that. I mean, you, you've seen a bit of cloud, maybe up to Mata Peak, and nothing compared to this. I mean, they came there and this is their encounter with God. And you're not some ordinary God. When God comes down on the earth, this is the kingdom of heaven visiting the earth. And it said, a cloud came. And then there were mighty crashing thunderings. There were flashes of lightning. And then there was a great earthquake. The whole mountain shook. Well, you know, some people get a little weak, kind of little quake, and they're all excited about it. You know, the lights swing a little bit. This is well beyond that. And then not only that, because kings come, there's usually an announcement. And so there's a mighty trumpet sound. This trumpet sounds, and it gets so loud that people begin to shake with fear because there's no one that they can see. This is our majestic God arriving. Surrounded by angels, it tells us in the Psalms. Chariots of angels. This is the God we serve. And his invitation is to Moses, come, we're going to talk together. What kind of God is that? Man, oh man, 
Oh, I'm excited. So I just love to see someone do, do, I loved it. Years ago, we saw the Ten Commandments. We saw this, saw Carlton Heston go up on the, up on the mountain. It was great. I loved it. I loved all of those movies because they just fire up your imagination. And, and when, when Moses, when Moses came up, the, the Lord spoke to him. He said, I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to reveal my name to you. And he said, but it'll blow you away, so I've got to cover you up a little bit and just see the back part of me, and then this is who I am. I am the Lord, the Lord God. I'm the eternal, invisible, almighty God who is all powerful. That's who I am. That's His majesty. So you would expect when God arrives, there will be a show. You know, I mean, if the President of the United States arrived, man, you'd see all these cars, black cars, black big vehicles, SUVs, and security people everywhere. You would all know he'd arrived. Even some of the rich people I meet in Taiwan, they find it hard to go to church because they've got so many guards and various people around them. If they arrive, you all know someone important arrived. So it's like, but when God arrives, that's what makes Jesus coming the first time so stunning. It's not what you'd expect. So we have a look down, just go down into Exodus chapter 24, Exodus 24, and God does it again. Exodus 24, let's see if we can find it again. And uh, <clears throat> so now we look in verse 16, it says, and the glory of the Lord or the majesty of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and covered it for six days. And what did it look like? The sight of the glory of the Lord or his majesty was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. Can you imagine if you, I mean, there's a little bit of smoke comes up there on Tomato Peak and everyone gets upset. They're waking up there with the fire brigade, put it all out. But this is a whole mountain and it's on fire and it's burning. There is a glory fire and God is in the midst of it. His presence is so magnificent that he is surrounded by the fire because it would overwhelm everyone. And it was there for six days. Imagine that six days. You look up, whoa, that thing's lighting up the sky. Man, oh man, what a, what a display of the majesty of God. And, there's, and you could go and meditate. Each of these things is God revealing something about himself. Let's have a look in Isaiah 6, Isaiah chapter 6. You find Isaiah also saw it. He got it by way of vision. They saw it with their physical eyes. Isaiah got it, and he got it by way of a vision. Look at this. In the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah 6 and verse 1. year King Uzziah died, Isaiah, uh, uh, King Uzziah was characterized by pride. Started well, finished bad. Pride got in his heart. And this is what he said. He had a vision. Isaiah had a vision. Of course, we look at these visions in the Old Testament. They don't make a lot of sense, when you, and people try to figure it out. But he's seeing in the Spirit. God has opened his eyes to look into the realm of the Spirit. Don't you hunger that God would open your eyes that you would see into heaven something of the majesty. This is what he saw. This is what he saw. He said his eyes were open. He said, I saw the Lord. So what was the Lord doing? He was sitting on a throne. Throne is a place of governance and rulership. The throne he saw was the throne of God a throne of mercy and truth, of righteousness and judgment. He saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And above the throne, there were seraphim, each with six wings and with two, he did cover his eyes. It's so magnificent. With two, he did cover his feet. With two, he did fly. Wow. See, this is, you see what Isaiah's trying to say? He's trying to use words to describe the majesty of Jesus, magnificent. And then he said, he said, I heard the Lord speak and say, who will go for us? Who shall we send? So encounters with the majesty of God, encounters with the glory of God are designed to shift us. The first thing that happened was his awareness of need for cleansing and God came and cleansed him with the angel. The second was he caught the heart of God, the passion of God to rescue people that he loves. He heard the heart of the king. Who will go for us? Who will we send? Well, it's interesting. The ones he sends are the ones who've had encounters with him personally, who have let him come to bring cleansing to them and have said, here am I. I'm willing. Send me. 
And God has not changed one little bit. He's still the same. He still wants to bring you into a powerful encounter with him. And in that encounter, you'll find usually you weep and weep and weep. And then you become aware of things and you start to repent and repent. And then you catch his heart, the heart who wants of a king who wants to save and deliver other people. You see, when the church neglects the majesty and the glory and the goodness of who God is, we become dull. We become tolerant of stuff we should not be tolerant of. We, we become neglectful of the heart of God and the, the mission to reach our community, to touch people who don't know our God who are living in bondage. If you're near to God, you'll hear His heart. It's not just to bless you, it's to commission you to represent Him. God is still looking for people He can commission to represent Him. Are you one of them? A fresh encounter with God shifts our willingness. So you notice the vision, the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. I meditate on that and pray that frequently in my prayer life, that I might catch glimpses of that. Have, have a look at another one in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, and this is uh, um, John, Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, and he's obviously in prayer. He says, after these things, verse 1, I looked and behold a door open in heaven, and the first voice I heard was like a trumpet saying, come up here, I'll show you things to come. Now here, someone else is getting a glimpse of the majesty of Jesus. What does he see? Man, it's just, see people look and they just, uh, we need to be impressed with God. <laughs> impressed with who is. Look what he saw. He said, he said, immediately I was in the spirit and I saw a throne set in heaven. Same thing Isaiah saw. And one who sat on the throne. Now he's got trouble giving words. He's, he's trying to explain the majesty of Jesus. And he's, oh, it's really hard. I'll, I'll use some words, but this is not easy to tell you. So he uses words like this. He said, and it, 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 he sat on the throne. There was like jasper and a side of stone in appearance and a rainbow around the throne, appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And it's the seat of God's government. And on the thrones, the 24 elders sitting clothed with white robes and crowns of gold. And from the throne, from the throne, now, think what we just read about uh, Moses when he was on the mountain. What was on the mountain? Lightnings, thunders, fire. Look what he says here. Out of the throne of God proceeded lightnings, thunderings, voices, lamps of fire burning. See, he's had an encounter with the heavenly reality. See, what Moses saw was the throne of God come down onto the top of the mountain, but because it was too much, God covered it so you couldn't see it, but it was there. Same things, thunders, lightnings. This is our God, powerful, powerful. And the Old Testament said, our Lord God, you are the Lord, you're the Lord God. There is nothing too hard for you. This is the God who's your God. This is the God that we serve, a God full of majesty and power and glory. But there are other ways that God can reveal and put his majesty on display. Why don't you look with me one in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Remember what majesty, there's many ways that his majesty can be put on display. Let me show you some more. In Luke chapter 9, I'd never seen this before. I don't know how, but mainly because the version I used, it didn't use that word. And I found out it is exactly the word. Luke chapter 9, verse 42. Luke 9. And there's a young boy who's got a demon. And it said he was coming down. The demon, uh, uh, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. And then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at what? The majesty of God. And everyone marveled at the things he did. Now notice, I want you to see this. One, remember the word majesty means magnificence, the great authority, the great power. One way his majesty is revealed is when people are delivered of tormenting spirits. Why is that? Because the magnificent kingdom of God is overcoming the kingdom of darkness and publicly humiliating the demons. 
Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28, if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come. So notice what it said. What did they acknowledge? They marveled at the majesty of God. Every time miracles are done, the majesty of God is seen. See, if we want the majesty of God to manifest, we must press in for miracles to take place. Miracles are a, a, a public display of the majesty, the magnificence, the power, the authority of God. When the church fails to operate in deliverance or believe for miracles, it is dishonoring God because it's not allowing his majesty to be put on display. God designed us and commissioned us that we would not only have relationship with him, we would represent him and we would put his majesty on display. It doesn't matter where you are, you are called to reveal the majesty, the authority, the power of our God that's above the natural circumstances. And you've got your own unique calling, your own unique place this works out, but every believer is called to work the works of God. So what else did Jesus do that displayed his majesty, his supreme authority, his magnificence? Here's other things that he did. He turned water into wine. Whoa. In other words, he demonstrated that even the substance of the physical world is subject to the authority he carries. He caused the loaves and fishes to multiply, indicating that he is unlimited in his resources. He can do creative miracles that cause a little to become much. That's the majesty of God. Every time you believe and he causes your little to become much, the majesty of God is being revealed, one aspect of it. When Jesus walked on the, on the waters, he was demonstrating the majesty of God, his power over creation. When he got in the boat, the boat immediately arrived at its destination. In other words, it was just shifted in space and time. Suddenly it's there at it's a, a, a place it's called. He demonstrated he is a God who has power over time and matter. He is unlimited. So every time Jesus did a miracle, his majesty was on display. We want the majesty of God. We need to press in to encounter him and for the miracles to take place. He found dead people. Now one knows dead person, once they're dead, unless you've got, <laughs> unless you've got our friend around there to help and <laughs> resuscitate you and pull you back. Break four ribs on the way, my, 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 my. I wonder if he's happy when he woke up. He probably thought, I wonder what's happened to me. I must have had a drunk fight or something. <laughs> no, but listen. There's a young girl and she's dead. Jesus raised her from the dead. There's a young man and he's dead. Jesus raised him from the dead. Then, just to cap it off, there's Lazarus who's not just dead. He's been rotting for four days and is a goner completely. And God recreates and brings back that body and brings him back to life. This is the majesty of God on display. Who would not want to see more of his majesty? More of his majesty. So we see the majesty of Jesus on display all through the Bible, and now it's manifested in his person. There's one other situation I want to look at, and then we'll just close up this session. Here's another one. Here's another, this one here is just, this is really classic. Now look at me in 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Got two more scriptures to look at. 2 Peter. And uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1. And here it is 2 Peter chapter 1. And Peter is writing, and I want you to watch carefully what he says. We did not follow the cunning devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And notice what he's saying. We didn't, uh, we're not making up stories here. We're not making up some tall story. He said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were eyewitnesses of what he will be like when he comes again. Now, we understand that the gospel is about Jesus coming 
giving his life on the cross so that now we can have access to the kingdom of God, but it's also he will come again. Except when he comes again, it won't be coming as the humble servant. He will be coming in the fullness of his majesty. He will be coming with a cloud of witnesses from heaven. He will be coming as a conqueror to conquer, to take back the earth that he created and then he redeemed. He will be coming back as an overcoming king who'll prevail over all his enemies and subdue them for a thousand years. He will rule out of Jerusalem on this earth. And so he said, now notice what he says. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we heard his voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now notice what he's saying. We were not just an eyewitness. We saw it. We heard it. We were there. And we can tell you exactly what it's like. And so three of the, uh, um, the apostles wrote and recorded what they saw. We're just going to have a look at one of them. We'll go to Matthew. Read in the book of Matthew. It'll be Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. So notice what he said. We saw his majesty when he came the first time. He came as a servant king. He came in a disguise virtually. He came in a way that people did not recognize him. Now notice what it says here in verse uh, 27 of Matthew 16. The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with angels. Now he's talking about the second coming. He's talking about a day when Jesus will return. And this is the great hope of the church. The return of Jesus Christ, the transformation of the church, and the advancement of his kingdom in the earth. And he says, he will come. He will come, and this time he will come in glory. He'll come with angels. And that is what he says, and he will reward each one according to his works. In other words, the life you are living now either qualifies or disqualifies you from being rewarded. If you've come to Christ, you are positioned in the kingdom, and your position as a child under tutorage of the Holy Spirit and ministries that you might grow and become mature and represent your Father in heaven. And he who is watching all of your works will evaluate what you have done with your life. Have you fulfilled the destiny he put you on this earth for? Have you operated out of the heart and spirit of the Father to accurately represent him? That's what he's looking for. He will reward. That word is like paying the labor. It's like there is something he has prepared for those who love him. And if you love him, you walk with him and keep his commandments. You practice walking in love. You practice loving the people you can see. Not just talking about how much you love God. You don't see. That's what it says then. And it says then, Assuredly, I tell you, some of you standing here will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. So now what he's saying is, there is a day when He will come. And we are to live prepared as if that day was today, but plan like it was not in our lifetime. You understand? We're to plan to live out our life and leave a legacy, but in terms of our character and our personal relationship with God, we're to live as though His coming is imminent. We're to prepare ourselves. Many of the parables were about preparing yourself. Church on the whole is not concerned about preparing itself because there's little understanding of what would be at stake. And it says, and then he goes on and then he tells exactly what happened. Some of you will see it. Now we read that John was one of them and here it is here. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John, his brother and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes become white as light. Verse five, while he was speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. That's the glory cloud and a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Now notice Jesus has given three of the disciples a glimpse of the majesty of his coming again. 
When he comes again, it will not be a child in a manger in the Middle East. He will come in great glory and majesty. He will be seen for who he is. And they saw it. They said, when the, as he prayed, the Bible says in Mark, it says he prayed. As he prayed, it says this, he began to change. That word transfigure is completely changed. So the body began to change. And from within his spirit, where the spirit of God dwelt, there started to shine forth light. It says that word, it says his face shone. That word means literally to give out rays of light because of the glory that was in him. It was so intense, all his garments began to shine white. They had an encounter with the majesty of Jesus. They were stunned. They didn't know what to do. The only thing they could think of doing when they saw his majesty, well, we just want to stay here. We just want to stay in that place. He said, no, we've got to come down. I have yet to go to the cross and to commission people to go into the earth and reveal my majesty. We need to see this theme through Scripture, the majesty, the great glory of our God, and let it touch and transform our heart. I can feel His presence here strongly. How do we respond? How do we respond? You, you got to, there's got to be a response. In many ways we can respond. Look what it says in Psalm 96. It says in Psalm 96, it tells us in verse, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord glory to his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and tremble before him all the earth. That's what he's saying. He's saying there is a way of coming into the presence of a king. You must bring something. We, we just want to come and attend church. This, this is because we've got a carnal mindset. We don't understand actually whether it's at home in prayer or whether it's I'm coming into a corporate meeting. I am coming into the presence of a king. I need to bring something. Now, if we don't know Christ, if we've never given our lives to Christ, the first thing we do is we bring our life and surrender our life and put our trust for him to transform what we've not been able to change. Bible tells us to everyone who received him, he gave power to become a child of God. To receive him means God's spirit comes into your dead spirit, puts supernatural life, awakens you, and now the life of God is on the inside. You are now removed out of the kingdom of darkness. You are now positioned as a child, part of a royal family. And we are then to grow and mature to represent our Father. If we're a believer, whenever you come into the presence of the Lord, always come with something. In Psalms 95, he says, I will bless the Lord. I will bless Him. I will praise Him. The Bible says, come into His presence. Come in with thanksgiving. Come into His gates with praise. Come give Him an offering. Whether it's a financial offering or it's the fruit of your lips, never come empty. If you go to kings, you bring a gift. When I go before great people, I bring a gift. It's not the size of your gift. It's the honour. Yeah. It's the honour. We're honouring the stature of the person. So when we come, don't take Him for granted. Don't take all this for granted. Come, there's Jesus, full of majesty, and I'm coming to encounter Him. It requires a response. What does He want? He wants worshippers. He wants people who worship Him. He wants people who will encounter Him. He will wants people who will align with Him. He wants people who will represent Him. He wants to commission you. And all of that comes out of the place of worship and engaging the majesty of God. I just read one scripture then. Let's, I want us to stand, begin to worship the Lord. In Psalm 145, that's what it says in verse 10. All your works shall praise you, O Lord. 
and your saints will bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk about your power and make known to the sons of men, let's testify, the mighty acts and the glorious majesty of His kingdom. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you. I want to challenge you to draw near to God, to start to hunger, to have revelation of His majesty, to search the Scripture. There's things you can do simply. Take one of those Scriptures, read it until you've learned it, and as you pray, begin to meditate on the majesty of our God. Talk about it. Speak to Him about it. Tell others about it. Testify about it. And surrender your life that you could carry some of that majesty into our community where you are. All your works will praise you. I can feel His presence here. Why don't we just stand? When we, when we come to worship and come into His presence, when we encounter Him, our body posture reveals what's in our heart. Sometimes it and clapping and praying strong in the Spirit. But as we encounter His presence, there's a bowing before His majesty. Probably you haven't talked to Jesus that way and bowed your majesty. My King, my coming King, I surrender to you. presence is here. If there's anyone here today and you're not a Christian and you want to receive Jesus Christ, I will lead you in a simple prayer to receive Jesus. Bring your life to Him. Present yourself to Him. You've done what you can with it, but you realize still there's an emptiness and a brokenness. There's a spiritual vacuum in your life that requires a personal connection with God Himself which comes through Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you, if you're here today, you're not in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter whether you go to church, that's not the point. It's the point is whether you're connected to the King. If you're not connected to Jesus Christ, never made a commitment publicly to come and surrender to Him and give your allegiance to Him to serve Him as your true King, then I invite you as we sing to make your way to the front and come here right now. Come, make your way right now. Come on, church, let's begin to sing. If there's anyone here wanting to give your life to Jesus, please make your way out of the seat. Make your way to the front. I will lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ. It's a turning point in your life. Please make your way. Just come. Come to the front right now. Come make your way to the front. Church, let's worship Jesus. There comes before the land. Come on, I can't hear it. Of God That's right. and see you worthy of it all. We surrender to you.
you can of your lives. You are all things. Oh, Jesus. Yes, to you are all things. Yes, you, you deserve, deserve the glory. Let this house be a house of prayer. Let it be a house of worship. Let our lives be a place of worship. Daily coming before you. Listen. Just listen to me. There's people here God wants to deliver you. There's some here you're oppressed with fear. You're having panic attacks and troubles with anxiety. There's like fear, a spirit of fear around your life. Why don't you come? This is a time Jesus showed His majesty by setting people free. If you've got troubles with fear, why don't you make your way to the front? If you're a person who's struggling with sleeplessness, make your way to the front. God wants to deliver you from that issue that's causing you to lose sleep, lack sleep, be troubled at night. If you're troubled with nightmares, God wants to deliver you and set you free, whatever's there. Come, let's come. Make our way right to the front. Let's come, whatever it is, whatever it is. There's other people need a healing in your body. When Jesus healed people, He demonstrated His majesty. We're going to carry out, we're going to worship the Lord. I want you just to stand at the front, wherever you are. Come right forward so there's room for others to come. And I want you to worship Him. Worship Him. Don't look for someone to come and pray for you, but rather worship Him. As you worship Him, cry out to Him and receive what He has for you. Come, 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 come. There's others need to come. Come, come. There's a presence of God here to touch lives. Oh, you will. Come, there's others here need to come. Come, make your way to the front. You are the other. The ministry team and pastors come. Get ready to lay hands on people. Just flowing it quietly now. The church is close your eyes. If you have to get away for children, do that. But let's just stay in that atmosphere of worship. His presence is here. God is here. His presence is here. You know, when His presence is here, we just need to extend our faith and believe right now we can be touched. Right now, wherever you are, even if you're in your seat, reach out to Him. Maybe you want to bow your head. I frequently, when I come into His presence and engage His majesty, I, I'll just put my hand over my heart and bow my head. I'm in the presence of of a sovereign king your majesty 
You're my king. I honor you. I honor you. And musicians, just keep flowing in it. Keep the atmosphere there. Ministry team, just come and just lay hands on people. Uh, you don't need to ask lots of details and questions. It's just about an impartation. If you're standing there and you're needing ministry of some kind, just receive. Perhaps there's someone needing breakthrough in finance. Why don't you come, just position yourself for God to touch you. Need some people to catch just in case it's full. Presence is here. Your glory is here. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Your presence is here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All that burden just lifting off you right now. God's restoring joy, restoring the prophetic. Father, touch him right now. Father, every heaviness, we break all heaviness right now. Father, I release blessing over Adam now. Touch, 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 touch. Day and night, night and day, let in censor. Presence of God. There's an amazing presence of God here. Touch, 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 touch. Minister, Lord. Minister, minister, minister. Pour out your life right now. Holy Ghost, come. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The presence of God is here. The presence of God touching you. Presented here, Father, we pray blessing on families. We pray blessing on marriages. We pray peace into homes. Father, we pray for the children. We pray, Lord, your hand to be upon them, to bless them. Father, we believe for a great generation to arise. Father, we pray for those in business. We pray for release of prosperity, enlargement of finances. We pray for the finances and families. We pray increase and enlargement in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just love being in your presence. We love being in your presence. Church, you're dismissed now. You're free to go. If you want to hang around in the presence of God, feel free to do that. If you want to stay in worship or just sit in your seat, just feel free to do that. Take, take the time to enjoy Him. To enjoy Him. <laughs>